Luli Faber interviews Jesus on the subject of how the human soul functions. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 1st of April 2013. This is session one, part two. Yeah. So the next understanding was the understanding of... Um, what was it? From dominance. The, dominance, that's it. Yeah, dominance of the soul. So this is a very important understanding, dominance. Would you like to know what it is? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't tell us. No, don't tell us. Yeah, <laughs> we'll just continue without. And it is a very, very important fact that we must accept if we truly understand our soul, and that is that our soul has been created to, be, to dominate the mind and to dominate everything else. Our soul has been created to dominate every single facet of our being. So we, if, we, if we believe that the mind has been created to be dominant, uh, we will be working in direct disharmony with our very creation, the purpose of our very creation. The purpose of our very creation from God's perspective is that our soul dominates everything that we do. And everything that we become is dominated by the soul. In fact, we are the soul, we are not our mind. Our mind is an attribute or, or organ of the soul. And if we believe ourselves to be our mind only, we are severely limiting our future development. And, uh, and so it's very important to understand dominance. Now, I forget how I've actually written it, uh, uh, so I'll just read it out. It's the principle that the soul dominates the mind and has full control over the mind, whether the mind believes itself to be in control or not. The mind is not capable of ever having full control of the soul, and the soul will always, at some point in our future, exercise its dominance since that is the purpose of its own creation. So I think that's a pretty succinct uh, way of stating this principle of dominance. Now, if we understand the soul to be, uh, and remember we've talked about in our introduction some of the other organs or, or characteristics or attributes of the soul besides the mind, of which we've talked about love, which is about the heart, humility, another quality, it's, it's also about emotions, sentiments, affections, desires, passions, longings. These are all parts of the soul. They're not a part of the mind. The mind can encourage them or try to deny them, but they will exist within the soul, these characteristics and attributes. So these characteristics and attributes can be suppressed and the mind attempt to go through the process of suppressing them, but sooner or later, they will be exposed. Sooner or later in our future progression. Now, when I say sooner or later, I've known people to go for thousands of years without them being exposed. So it's possible to, to attempt to suppress them for such a long period of time. But, but in the end, they will be exposed. That is a guarantee because the, the way the soul is being created is that the soul would dominate the mind. And therefore, these things, the passions, desires, aspirations, intentions, the heart, the emotion, the, this emotional, sentimental part of our being is always in the end going to dominate what happens to our mind. So how does it work for natural love spirits who've got to the sixth sphere by using their intellect? Well, they haven't got to the sixth sphere by using their intellect. Because oh. if they just use their intellect, they wouldn't progress one iota from where they arrived in the spirit They've world. They've inadvertently engaged their soul in the process? They've had to engage their soul in the process to get to the sixth dimension. The way that they've engaged their soul is they've started to realise with their mind that moral development is an important part of their development. In other words, instead of just developing their intellect, they had now made an active choice to develop their morality. And, and by that I mean their morality and ethics in terms of love, the expression of their love. So instead of doing the things they would normally do, they've made up their mind to develop parts of their soul and to develop those parts of the soul which the mind accepts. And they've accepted internally that they have to develop their moral code, 
their internal moral compass, right? And so what they've done is they've chosen to do that. They've chosen to go through this process, through the law of compensation, go through this process, firstly of compensating for all the things they did that were out of harmony with love, but then they've also had to engage new truths by releasing errors of concept that they've had about ethics and morals. So they've had to release the old beliefs that they've had about immoral behaviour and accept new beliefs about moral behaviour. And they've had to go through this process emotionally. Right? So, so they have engaged a process of soul-based change, but it's been limited to what their mind would allow. So it's only, it's only changing through what their mind would have allowed. Just making sure I have switched it off of mute. Um, so, so what that means then is that there's this uh, process that they've been naturally engaging without them even really being aware of engaging that has caused them to change and to grow. And if they had not have engaged that process morally and ethically, they would still be in the same location that they began in, in the spirit world. Yep. So they've had to make changes in the same way. They've just not engaged God or God's love or any of God's truths, uh, or, or when I say any of God's truths, any of God's truths about God in the process. They have engaged God's truths about other things, about the moral, the moral laws of the universe and the ethical laws of the universe. They've had to engage those because if they didn't engage those, they would never have gotten to, the, to become the perfect natural man. But do they believe that they are still working from the mind, though? They believe they're still working from the but mind. But they're not. But they've made a heap of soul-based changes, right. which they have used their mind to make. So they, they've used their mind to assist the soul in releasing the error and in, and in getting the new belief. The way they've done that is they've gone through a process of what we often in the spirit world refer to as forgetfulness. They, they've forgotten the reasons for their own unloving behaviour by accepting new reasons for loving behaviour. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they have had to change at the soul level and, uh, and, and they have had to go through that process. And, and that process is still the same like no matter who you are, whether, you, 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 whether you're on the divine love path or on the natural love path. However, on the divine love path is a much more rapid process because you can receive divine love which transforms the belief systems in your soul as, if you allow it to, if you allow the emotional release of the error as it goes. And this is a very rapid way then of absorbing new truths into the soul because the error is now left and been forgiven and uh, as a result, the new truth enters very rapidly. And so you can grow quite rapidly. But again, you have to have a desire for that truth to enter you. If you have no desire for it to enter you, you'll stay stagnant until you have a desire to enter, to, to actually absorb the new truth. And that applies whether you're on the divine love path or on the natural love path. If you don't have a desire for a truth and you don't have a desire to live in harmony with the truth, then no change can occur anyway. Mm. Okay. Well, um, should we use an example for dominance? Yeah, that you sure, have here? sure. So the example was um, about violence again. Um, yep. Violence towards anyone is not loving. Yep. And the error is that person, yes, this is the same one, but yep. differently. Yeah, that exactly. person has made me angry, so violence towards them is justified. Exactly. So if we look at this point in the point of dominance, what we're really saying here is that my soul will dominate my intellect and its ability to reason and its ability to determine the truth on this subject. So, so while I might have received a concept, and like I've said in many of our discussions with people, I've talked about pe to people that violence under any circumstances is out of harmony with love. Now, many of them have received this concept in their mind only. So in other words, in their mind, they can sort of see, yeah, I can sort of see why, you know, violence under any circumstances is unloving, right? But then put them in a circumstance which is which has been violent towards themselves, or even the circumstance that is just tri challenging for themselves. Many times they resor re still resort to violence, and the reason why is because they have not respected the fact that their soul will dominate their actions, not their mind. And while their soul has in it justifications for violence, those justifications under certain trigger points will be exposed. And, and will undoubtedly be acted upon. And, that's, and so they have not understood this principle of dominance. They've not understood that you can't just absorb a thought 
and have a change. A change has to occur in the soul for the change to actually occur in your day-to-day -day life because if it doesn't, sooner or later a situation will occur where the soul reverts to its dominance and overcomes the mind's reasoning ability and causes a certain action to be taken that might be out of harmony with truth or love. And while I believe that my mind is dominant, I'm really in a place that's very dangerous because I'll absorb this truth in my mind and absorb that truth in my mind and absorb this truth in my mind thinking that I'm changing. And I might even choose through my mind to change my actions. And that would tend to indicate to myself that I am changing. But the reality is if my actions are not automatic, I have yet to change. If my actions of love are not automatic, I've yet to change. So if we talk about another example, I've often talked to people about telling the truth in all circumstances and situations, right? Now, for the majority of people, this, this underlying truth of telling the truth in all situations and circumstances hasn't entered their soul because you place them in a circumstance or situation where you know, they're afraid of their family or afraid of their friends or afraid of public opinion or whatever fear is triggered, bang, the truth goes out the window in an instance, right? And they, 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 they might not tell a lie, but they'll sit there, you know, <laughs> not saying the truth either. Now, that is an indication that the truth has yet, that truth of always telling the truth has yet to enter their soul. It's only entered their mind as a concept. And, and until it enters the soul, nothing's really changed. It's just in their mind. Their soul hasn't changed. They haven't grown on the issue. Once they release the error, through, as we talked about through absorption, we know that we have to release the error in order for this truth of telling the truth all the time for it to, to, to work. Once we release the error, which are, which, which are the different circumstances and situations under which we're willing to compromise truth, if, once we release those, we'll never compromise truth in any situation anymore. Right? Then we could say the truth is in our soul, only then. Before that time, it's just an intellectual concept in our mind and our soul error will govern our actions under, under the circumstances. So we get into a circumstance that we've yet to release the error about. So the circumstance might be, I badly need approval of others. That might be the circumstance. So whenever that approval of others is threatened, right? because I've not yet released that error, that thing that's out of harmony with God's love and out of harmony with God's truth, because I've yet to release that from my soul, I revert to either speaking a lie or revert to not disclosing the truth. I, I revert to just sh shutting up you know, and not, and not disclosing anything. And that tells me that that's the circumstance I need to find the error. If I used my mind wisely, what I would do then is I'd go, okay, that just told me that my soul still got the error. Where is the error? Now, I know through the circumstance that the error is related to public opinion, how people think about me. So that's where I need to focus my time and effort on finding the error and releasing it so that I can have the truth enter my soul rather than it just being an intellectual concept in my mind. So that's an example where the changing your actions in a more loving direction is beneficial, though, because then that um, exposes the error. Exactly. In the situation. Exactly. So, so if I had really used my mind again to change my actions, I would feel the feeling in that circumstance come up where I can, I can feel I've got to say the truth. I, I can feel I've got to say the truth. And in that moment, I would honour that truth, right? If I have not yet released the error of compromise, I would be able to, if I had released the error of compromise, I would be able to honour that truth and speak up even though I'm terrified. I'd be able to do that, right? But, but because I have honoured my fear rather than honouring the truth, I'm still, this, is, this situation is telling me, ah, another situation where I honoured fear over truth, which means the truth of telling the truth has yet to enter my soul. And I need to find out why, what, what the error is in my soul that's preventing this truth that's in my mind from entering my soul. Now, I feel that if most people understood this dominant principle, 
they would realize that their soul is always dominant. And it doesn't matter how much they try to exercise their mind for dominance. In the end, the soul will always revert to dominance. And in fact, that's the way God created it to be. God created our soul to finish up being the dominant part of our nature because the soul is the real self. The mind is just an appendage of the real self. The soul is the real us, the complete unit of the soul has all of these organs of which the mind is only one. And while I'm trying to use one organ to dominate the rest, of course, at some point in the future, it's not going to work out too well for me. And this is the problem I feel most people who are mind dominant have is that they are trying, 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 always trying to dominate their soul, their entire being with one appendage of their soul. And in the end, it's never going to work. There's always, they're always going to revert to the soul's dominance at some point. And if the soul contains error, then it's going to be the error that dominates. If the soul contains truth, then it will be the truth that dominates. It just depends on what the soul contains as to, how, to, to what the end result will be. If the soul contains love, then love will dominate. But I can believe I'm loving with my mind, and at the very same time as that, my soul dominant emotions are not loving at all. And, you know, we speak very frequently to people. Even we had a discussion yesterday with a group of people where I talked about with them the dominance of some of their minds over their soul. They're, and they're not even aware of their soul emotions until I talk about them with them. Why is that? That's because they're using their mind to think that I'm good or think that I'm happy. Or, and, and it's a very arrogant uh, way of operating, but it's also a very fear-based generally way of operating. And that is... I'm trying to use my mind to tell me that I'm a good person. When my soul's actions and the, what, hap, what I do with my life demonstrates to me, actually, I'm not as good as I think I am, but, but I'm trying to ignore that as well. And it's not a natural thing to be loving under those circumstances. And what I'm suggesting to people is if there's a change in the soul, if we understand dominance, if there's a change in the soul, then the change in the soul will be reflected in my day-to-day -day life instantly. And, and, and my soul will dominate my actions. And if my soul is loving, then all of my actions automatically are dominated by, loving, by a loving soul. If my soul is unloving, then all of my actions will be pretty much re really, relatively easy exposed as being unloving through that process. And this is where we require some sense of honesty with self. Most people who are, are still in their mind are not very honest with themselves because they're not honest about the soul and its emotions that still dominate their feelings and their actions. They try to ignore their soul all the time. And it's very, very dangerous to ignore your soul in any form of development. Yeah. I was, I was just going to say, in neuroscience, there's actually this whole area of research about trying to get the mind to control feelings. Ah, and there's yeah. this whole, like, the whole idea of how to treat anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder is all about training the mind to try and suppress the emotions. And they know it doesn't work. No. Because they put the person, and even in animals, they put an animal in another situation. Yeah. And, from, it and it reverts back. To older behaviour. Yeah. yeah. But they're trying really hard to get it to work. It's strange, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And in a way, that's a reflection of the intellectual dominance of the people doing the experiment and the lack of understanding of their soul, their own soul, and how the soul has been created to be dominant. And what, what we can temporarily or partially suppress the soul with our mind, but it's never going to work for good. It can, it can never work for good. Because it's, it's sort of almost like, I, I often liken it to nature, you know, like you can maintain a home, for example. You know, we build a home out of dead material, for example, and we have to maintain it because we built it out of dead material. So we, we spend all of our time maintaining it because normally the elements will eat the dead material and det put it into nothing you know, unless we maintain it, right? So, so what we choose to do is we choose to build it out of dead material and then maintain it. And we have to maintain it. But as soon as we die or we leave the home, we come back a year later and it's a mess. <laughs> Why is it a mess? Because nature reverts to its normal natural process. And in the case of a home, nature eats dead material. That's what it does. That's its natural process. It converts dead material into matter that it can use to support life. So it uses it as food, if you like, for, for life. 
and that's its natural process. And because that's its natural process, we come back a year later and our house is a mess. Everything inside is a mess. There's spiders, there's living creatures everywhere, there's, you know, there's paint feeling off, all sorts of things, more so even than if we were in it, right? There's terrible destruction occurs. Now, we say that's a natural process. And what we're trying to do with maintaining our home is work against the natural process. Well, that's, a, that's almost like an analogy for what we do with our soul. We're often using our mind to work against the natural process of our soul. In the end, it's going to require maintenance. In other words, constant upkeep, constant trying, constant, constant demand upon our constant demand upon our attention and so forth. It's just going to be completely overwhelming eventually for us because we don't understand that the nature of the soul is that the soul controls, not, not the mind. Now, if we, instead of doing that, we, for example, with a house, if instead of building a house out of dead material, we worked out, oh, okay, nature eats dead material, but it doesn't eat live material. So if I build my house out of live material somehow, if I come up with some technologies that are alive and build my house out of live material, nothing's going to eat it. It's going to survive for good. I won't it's going have to get to. bigger. It's going to, yeah, it might even <laughs> grow and I, and I won't have to maintain it, right? Now, that same principle applies with our soul. The same principle is if I now start working on my soul, which is, which is naturally dominant, and I promote its dominance rather than trying to suppress its dominance, and I work on anything inside of my soul that creates a dominance in an unloving direction, and I release that from my soul, then what I'm going to be left with is an automatic natural process that I will not have to upkeep. That's what I'm going to be left with. I'm going to have, be able to have no effort in my progression, my future progression under those circumstances because my soul has learnt that it's dominant and everything then as a result respects the dominance of the soul. And then because we respect the dominance of the soul, we realise that anything that we do or attract that's out of harmony with love, we realise we have to release something that's inside of the soul so that we can release that part of the soul's dominance that's negative. And so we release it and we're left with only loving things that dominate our soul. Now, that would be a far more logical process to follow if we understood our soul and we understood the principle of dominance. What I feel is that most people still don't understand that principle and they're working with their mind, working with their mind, trying to change their actions, changing their actions. A lot of people have become vegans just because Jesus talked about it on a, you know, on a you know, interview or some kind of presentation. But they haven't had a shift in their soul. What's the point of doing that? Why not stay eating meat and feel guilty about it? That would probably be better. You might change faster there and work out what's going on in the soul. Do you know what I mean? Um, See, a lot, a lot of people change their actions without changing their soul. The best course of action is to change your actions, but always be conscious that unless the soul changes, changing the action is not going to have any long-term benefit to you. Right? That's the best course of action. So when you notice something is out of harmony with law, with God's law of love, change your action, but understand that changing your action is not the end of it. Because unless something changes in your soul that allowed you to perform the previous unloving action, unless that is released from you, your soul has not changed. And unless your soul changes, you're not going to get closer to God, you're not going to be closer to yourself, you're not going to realise the power and potential of your soul. So when I understand dominance, I will stop using my mind just to change my actions all the time and I will start using my mind to assist the soul to find the reasons why I have a certain action and release the reason, the error inside of the soul, that's how I will use my mind. I will focus my mind on using it to expose the error and allow its experience so that it leaves me. Instead of using my mind to suppress the error and cover over the experience, which is the way most people are using their mind. But... <clears throat> Because of the way that God's designed it, it's only going to work for a little while. Exactly. It can only work for a while. Now, when I say a little while, in, if, if, we compare, <laughs> if we compare like eternal existence, then it might, might in extreme cases work for a thousand years or a few thousand years. But 
But in the end, it, it cannot work for good because, it, because God's created the soul to dominate. And so I've met people who have, not, who, who have gotten to the sixth dimension of the spirit world, who have not progressed further for 2,000 years. But when you talk to them, I can feel in their soul the dissatisfaction. There's a little points of dissatisfaction that the soul's starting to revert, <laughs> you know, and start to dominate again. It's feeling, it's feeling its dissatisfaction, the dissatisfaction of not having a relationship with God. It feels, and so it's the soul is still, even though they've tried to suppress it with their intellect, their mind, and you know, taken it and all, and distracted it with as much distractions as possible through two thousand or three thousand or five thousand years of life. In the end, the soul's still going. Listen to me, listen to me. <laughs> You're not listening to me. <laughs> you know, and, and that's uh, the soul has been designed to do that. God designed the soul in, in a very clever way. And, and, uh, and, and it's been designed to constantly, constantly badger us when it knows something is not right and, and to dominate us, even though we might try to intellectually dominate it for lot, most of our existence. Mm. So that's the point of, uh, is there any examples we want to raise there? Oh, we used that. Probably is, yeah. But yeah, so that was the point of dominance. And I feel if people can understand dominance and then look at, so we're now, we've now got the three principles that we've looked at. We've looked at the preclusion principle, with, which is the state of the soul currently. We looked at the, the absorption principle, which is the state of how we can grow the soul. And then if we look at this uh, principle of dominance, we're now looking at what we should be focusing on if we're going to develop. We, in, we need to stop the focus on intellectual development and mind-based development and we need to start really feeling. Because remember, our soul, as I've said in this section here, I think I wrote down some things about it. I said the soul is emotion, sentiment, desire, passion, longing, aspiration, feeling, sensory, fervour, excitement. All these kind of feelings are a part of our soul. These are all a part of the soul's organs. And so what we do is we start focusing on the development of them rather than some suppression of them. And, and we use our mind now, rather than using our mind to try and dominate the soul, we go, okay, I give up. <laughs> In our mind we go, I give up. You are, soul is more dominant. You're, you know, the emotions and, the, and all these other feelings that we described, all these sensory feelings are always going to dominate me. What I need to do is to bring them into harmony with love and truth. That's what I need to choose to do. And now I can use my will, which comes from my soul, and my mind uh, as an intellectual tool to actually allow the development and dominance of these particular things, but only allow the dominance in the direction of developing further in love and truth. In other words, whenever I notice an error, I want to release the error rather than live in the error. I want to get rid of the error from myself rather than stay in it all the time. Right? And uh, I feel if people focus their attention on that with their mind uh, and use their mind as a tool of the soul to help the soul do its thing, then they would find progress much more rapid. Mm. So that's the principle of dominance. <laughs> How are you going so far? I'm enjoying it. Mm. So interesting. Mm. It's putting, it's um, bringing together lots of things. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I understood a bit over there and a bit over there, a bit over there. And now it's like kind of yeah. all making sense a bit more. Yeah, I sort of feel for a lot of people, it's um, like they've heard me say a lot of different things, right? But not really understood that it's the way the soul's been created to work. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, there's not that underlying understanding that, that God's designed it this way. It's so clever. Mm. It's, it's so very cool. Clever. Yeah. <laughs> it's just remarkable. <laughs> Everything God does is so clever, eh? It's just yeah. Like, it's just like, you can just think about that one thing and just go, wow, yeah. for ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, that's what I like about a lot of this material is that, is that it, it's sort of, um, it illustrates that it's all by design. It's not, it's not some, like I think one of the biggest problems, maybe we should start rolling in. One of the biggest problems that I see is that um, 
that people on Earth sort of believe that everything that happens to them and everything that happens around them is some sort of happenstance, you know, some sort of chance that dictates everything. And um, because they don't understand the principle of the soul, they don't understand that actually, no, there's nothing happening here by chance. It's all by design. Everything that's going on is by design. And the way the soul works is by design. And you can try to circumvent the design. You can try to work around the design for a period of time, but it's going to require huge amounts of effort, constant, constant effort. If you work with the design, you get this beautiful, smooth thing starting to occur. So it's a bit like what I notice mankind doing with a lot of things on the planet, you know, with regard to the na nature even. You know, we're constantly working against the design. Like the, things have been designed a certain way and we're constantly working in, in opposite direction. That's why we, we, we spend a lot of our lives maintaining things. And, and that's because we're working against their design constantly. If we worked with their design, we wouldn't need to maintain anything. Right? And that also applies to the soul. If we work against its design, it's going to require constant work, constant pressure, constant effort, constant... We're going to be constantly disappointed because we're going to have to have constant adjustments. But if we work with the soul, we'll get to the point where it requires no effort at all. And that's the beauty of what God has created by design. Like it's all by design. The way the soul works, so, so far we've learned about, you know, this, this, this dominance. That's by design. God designed our soul to be dominant. God designed our soul that truth and, er and error it can't exist in the soul at the same time. And God designed our soul that error can't, uh, truth can't enter it while error is in it. That's by design. The process of absorption is by design. So these are all things that God has designed into our soul and, and we're constantly trying to work against it. Like That's what I see happening on the planet. We're just constantly trying to work. We want it to be a different way. And a lot of times because of, uh, well, probably the fourth and fifth points that we're going to discover, which are a lot about pain and suffering. You know, that's why we <laughs> often want it to be a different way. But, but even that is by design. Like every time God has created this framework of laws and every law that we follow that's in, in harmony with the law, by design, we're going to experience joy, happiness and, and, and peace and a lot of other beautiful emotions. Every time with these laws that we, we, we go away from their design, what they're designed to do, out of harmony with love, whenever we act out of harmony with the law of love, by design, there's a corrective process. It's all by design. And, and we're, there, we're rebelling against the design, thinking that we know better. But, but if, we, if we thought about it clearly, we could see if this body is designed so cleverly, then surely the universe in which it lives is probably going to be designed even more cleverly. <laughs> and the framework in which the universe in which we live is probably also going to be even more clever than that again. You know, it would all, we'd understand it's all by design. But unfortunately, we don't go down that track. What we do instead is re rebel against the design. So we're constantly trying to use our body, use our soul, use our mind and all of the things that are a part of ourselves in a, in a, in a way that's directly opposing its design. And we're saying that we're the intelligent ones. And we're so, yeah, we're saying we're the intelligent ones. Doing <laughs> aren't we brilliant? This, right? Yeah, aren't we brilliant? We can use something <laughs> outside of its design. <laughs> and, and of course, we're going to get a lot of pain and suffering in that process. We go, why are we having so much pain and suffering? You know, like not yeah, It's a flaw to evolution <laughs> exactly, or like, something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and the reality is it's by design. We, we're going to have pain and suffering every time we use something outside of its design parameters. You know, you, you grab a knife and you use it inside its design parameters, there's no pain and suffering. But you grab a knife and use it outside of its design parameters, you know, outside of its purpose for which it's been designed, there's going to be pain and suffering. It could even be death, you know. And a lot of pain, physical pain to the body and so forth can result using it out of harmony with its design, with its, the real purpose of its design, or if we could say the loving purpose of its design. And with God, everything that God has designed has a loving purpose. All the laws God's designed have a loving purpose. God doesn't design anything without a loving purpose. 
and we're there rebelling, 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 <laughs> you know, trying to use our soul outside of the parameters of its design, of course we're going to end up with a lot of pain and suffering as a result. Mm. So that, that's a little aside perhaps, but before we get on to the next point, which is the point of understanding progression. And here I'm referring to when we talk about the point of understanding progression, we're talking about how the soul progresses. So up until this point, you see, by, by now we've now we're starting to establish some basic parameters for the soul. We've got the parameter of, of preclusion. So we know now that, that truth and error can't exist in the soul at the same time. We understand absorption. We understand that truth can't enter the soul while error exists in it. Love can't enter the soul while hatred exists in it on the same subject at the same time. All of these principles are true. So, so we understand that. We understand the soul was created to be dominant. So now we're getting a bit of a picture of how we need to develop our soul, right? And then there's this issue of how do we now develop our soul? How does the soul actually progress? What, what, what do we do to actually help the soul progress? And this is, the, this is the point about understanding the truth about progression of the soul. And so what I've said in this truth, and I'll probably read it, is, it is the pr progression is the principle that true progression within the soul can only be obtained through an emotional process that will involve both pain, which is associated with emotions related to error, and pleasure, which is associated with emotions relating to truth. If the soul denies either pain or pleasure or uses its mind to deny pain or pleasure, progression cannot occur. So I think it's pretty obvious what that means. <laughs> it means that if, if we are always trying to control the outcome of our feelings when it comes to our soul that with our mind, then it's going to be very, very difficult for our soul to progress. We can't progress without experiencing pain or pleasure, both pain and pleasure generally. Now, we get to a point when all pain is released. So once we get to the point of at one moment with God, all pain is released. And from that moment on, we cannot progress without pleasure. <laughs> that, 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 sounds, that sounds good. <laughs> um, but until that point... Error exists within the soul, and error is always associated with pain. So, so we cannot progress until to that point without allowing both pain and pleasure. And if you think about it, the more error that we have within our soul, the more pain we will need to experience in order to have it released. So, but it will be a combination of pain and pleasure, not just pain only. And this is what I feel many people miss when it comes to emotional work. They, they do not understand the pleasure of accepting truth. They only understand the pain of releasing error. But we need both. We need to do both. We need to have, we will have, if we truly progress, we will have both pain and pleasure. So if we suppress pleasure, which many people have taught themselves to do, as much as they've taught themselves to suppress pain, we're going to really have a lot of struggle in terms of progressing towards God. Because as we get closer and closer to God, we will have more and more pleasure. So obviously, if we're resistant to pleasure, we're going to get to a point at some point where we stagnate in our progression of the soul. Now, if you think about pain and pleasure, the mind is capable of neither. It's only the sensations that are a part of our body, physical and, and spiritual, and also a part of our soul that are capable of experiencing these particular feelings. They are sensory and emotional. They are not an intellectual thought. They are sensory and emotional experiences. So this is why we must understand that pain and pleasure are a part of our progression. So this principle of progression is the principle that we will not be able to progress unless we experience both pain and pleasure, particularly if we're not yet at one with God. Once we're at one with God, there'll be no more pain to experience. And of course, we still need to be open to pleasure. <laughs> Otherwise, we cannot progress beyond that point. We cannot progress further in more knowledge and more love of God 
without, while we are still resistant to pleasure. So we need to have no resistance to pleasure and no resistance to pain. Now, unfortunately, for the majority of people on the planet, we've got usually uh, what we believe is no resistance to pleasure, but at the same time, we've got huge resistances to pain, emotional and physical. And as a result, since pain is only associated with error, it will be impossible for us to release error while we are shutting down pain. And that's an important thing to understand about the soul. If I shut down, if I use my mind to shut down pain, if I shut down the experience of pain, if I avoid the experience of pain, if I run away or deny the experience of pain, I am shutting down the release of error. And if I don't release error, truth cannot enter me on that same subject that I'm not releasing the error about. So I'm, I'm causing my own stagnation if I do that. And this is the principle of progression. We need to understand what really causes progression. And it's the ability to freely accept both our pain and our pleasure. And if you think about it, that is a humble state to, to receive, to be able to freely accept our own pain and pleasure. We're humble to both sets of emotions. Yeah. So you've talked about in the past how um, you can absorb a new truth and it can bring you pleasure. But sometimes when you've released an error and it's been painful and then the truth comes in, that's not necessarily associated with a pleasurable experience at that point in time, is it? Um, I don't know if I'd agree with that, Lily. Right. Yeah, because in every case that I've ever received a truth, it's always been a pleasurable experience. I might have cried during the experience, in joy in many cases. Or there sometimes, as you receive a truth, new errors become exposed and they will often be then painful as a result. So, you know, it depends how rapidly you can process emotion in the end, doesn't it? So sometimes when you receive a new truth and that triggers an acknowledgement of further error, which then, of course, has a whole heap of emotions associated with it that are painful, so that sometimes occurs. And often does occur when you're on the path with God because... You rapidly go from one emotion to the other emotion sometimes during that process. So remember in a previous example that I used in a previous understanding, I used the example of slowly becoming aware that violence perpetrated by my parents was actually an assault on myself. So remember how I showed during that example how, how one particular aspect of truth, once it's absorbed by my soul because I've released the error, exposed another error that then meant I had to process some more emotion. And so this is why sometimes people who are progressing on the divine love path feel there's no joy because they go from one error, release it, absorb the truth very rapidly, and they don't notice the joy of absorbing the truth because it triggers the awareness of another error. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, they then have more pain as a result of that awareness of this new error. Now, now that, that is just a natural process, but the, the, the truth, when they look at the truths in retrospect, they will always feel a joy associated with, that, uh, with acknowledgement of that truth. So for example, once I acknowledge to myself emotionally, and it enters my soul as a truth, that, that any person who perpetrates violence towards me is unloving, this becomes a joy to acknowledge. Because now I have the ability to determine what is unloving behaviour towards myself. And therefore I have, a, a, I have an ability to recognise who is loving in my life and who is not. And that, that means that I can make a choice and spend more time with the people who are loving and therefore have more joy in my life as a result. So, so in, when we look at retrospect to all of the truths, we'll always feel them with joy. But in the process... The realisation, the remembering the truth or acknowledging the truth of, oh, well, my parents were really unloving to me in that situation, that doesn't feel good. Well, it does actually, I don't know about you, but it has felt good for me because it, I've recognised that my feelings about that subject of violence were, were real, were true. And so I'm now acknowledging 
a part of my soul as containing truth that I never acknowledged before. Oh, you're celebrating the process. I'm celebrating, yeah. So for me, and I feel this is where a lot of people lose their joy in the process. They're not celebrating the truths they learn. And, and you can celebrate them. Like all of the truths that we learn need to be celebrated because they're all causing the growth of your soul. And I'm not saying the truths that you learn here because you won't celebrate those because it's just a thought. The truths that you will actually celebrate are the truths that are now in your soul as an emotion. You will definitely celebrate those. So I would suggest to people that if they're not celebrating the truth, then it's yet to really enter them emotionally because of an error. And, and usually I find that to be the case. Well, when I say usually, in, in all cases I've found that to be the case. So for example, if I can't celebrate the truth that my parents treated me badly as a child, it's because I still have yet to release sadness about my parents treating me badly as a child. Does that, that make makes sense? That makes sense, yeah. And once I release the error or release the feeling that my, the, the grief associated with the feeling that my parents treated me badly as a child, I will be able to celebrate the truth of the, my acknowledgement of that fact. And it will be a celebration in me. I'd go, wow, this is changing my life. Now I, don't, I realise I don't have to accept this poor behaviour from people who say they love me but who act like they don't. I don't have to accept this anymore. How, how much would that change my life if I really felt that inside of myself and celebrated that truth? So I feel what's happening for a lot of people is they can't celebrate the truth yet because they're yet to release the error on the same subject fully. And, and, and once you've released the error on a subject fully, you will always celebrate the truth of it. It doesn't matter how horrific it is even. You'll always celebrate the truth of it. And also there's this underlying thing that occurs and that is you're now honouring the dominance of your soul. right? And there's a lot of joy in that. You always feel joy in honouring the dominance of your soul. So there's all these joys that result if you... Because you're... Behaviour has changed. Because your behaviour has changed. But not only that, you've honoured your past experience now fully. You've honoured the fact that you've been hurt. Instead of denying it and shoving it down and saying it never happened and trying to get away and run away from it all your life and, and it affecting all the different choices and decisions that you've made throughout your life, you've now honoured the fact that all of that rubbish that happened in my life, that painful suffering experience that I had, all came from this. And I've now honoured my experience of that so much that now it's stopped all of this unloving behaviour and all of these unloving actions and all of these unloving results and all of these painful results that have caused my suffering. And I can rejoice in that. You know, I can be happy about that. And I know once, once you've gone through that process, you know for certain you will never revert to allowing that or revert to feeling that somebody, in the case of, of in the example I've given, revert to feeling that somebody who's violent with you is loving you. You'll never again ever consider that as truth. And that's a beautiful thing too, because that gives you the ability to choose your associates wisely now. So instead of accepting unloving behaviour as loving and accepting violence as loving, you're now never going to do that. So who are you going to be with? You're going to be with people who are never going to be violent towards you as a result of that. So that gives you the power to make choices in your life that love you further. And you'll always, you'll always think the reason why this power came was because I let go of that error and I let go of that pain that I had about my parents and I let go of all of that. And as a result of that, this is why my life has changed. And, and, as a, and you'll always have that joy of that experience of knowing that. And so, yeah, I feel, I feel if a person isn't experiencing joy in their, in their processing of error uh, and the exhaustion of truth, obviously in the processing of error, there won't be much joy in that, but the absorption of truth, it's because the error on the same subject has yet to fully leave them. So I guess this is why you get happier and happier and happier and happier. Exactly. Um, because you're fully releasing more and more and more and then you're celebrating more of the truth. Exactly. And you have less crap left in your soul. Exactly. And you have more love into your soul from God and from your surroundings. And as a result of that, you feel better about yourself. You, you, you have more worth and so forth and so forth. There's so many advantages. And no if wonder that it's is, exponential. Yeah. And if that is not happening, then you're not being real about the path. You're not following the path if that's not happening. 
If that's not happening, then something's wrong with what you're doing. And I feel for many people, there are things wrong with what they're doing. They, they're embroiling themselves in emotions that are not theirs or they're embroiling themselves in experiences where they're not being truthful or honest with themselves about what's going on. They're not happy with releasing error. They rebel against releasing error and that causes a lot of pain. They continually break God's laws, which cause more pain. They still are in rebellion against God, which causes more pain. And unless you change some of these behaviours, which can only change by getting rid of the error in the soul that creates them, um, there will be the continuous creation of pain. And the more sensitive we become to our soul, the more we're going to feel it. Yeah. And I feel if you look at the planet right now, so we're in 2013, there's a lot of pain on the planet. There's a lot of pain on the planet as a result of people choosing to rebel, of people choosing to rebel against God's laws, really, in the end. And, and then they say, you know, as I discussed with the group yesterday, um, we, often, we often say, well, I don't want to go back to my painful childhood experiences because I'm in too much pain about my current experiences, right? But we don't understand. Our current experiences are caused by our dominant soul exercising itself in a direction that's in disharmony with God's laws of love. That's why we have pain. So if I could help my dominant soul through this process of progression to progress from the state of exercising its will dominantly in a negative direction out of harmony with love into exercising its will dominantly in a, in a process that's in harmony with love, then my pain and suffering in my current life will reduce and I'll have a much easier ability to connect with old pain and suffering as well and release that through that process. So that's what I would encourage people to do. That's what this, this point of progression is all about, understanding that progression is not possible without an emotional process. It's not possible. You can intellectually absorb something and, and, and if... It is a truth that enters your soul, even if there is no error and it's just a truth that you're letting into your soul and there's no error in your soul already precluding the truth from entering. It will be an emotional process as it enters you, but it will be an emotional process of pleasure. You, you will cry in joy <coughs> of receiving this truth. If, and then, it's, then it will be in your heart, then it will be in your soul. If there was error in your soul and you're trying to absorb this truth into your soul, then the error must first relief, re release according to the process of absorption that we've already discussed. It has to release. If I allow its release by allowing dominance, allowing the dominance of my soul to dominate how it feels and how I feel in that process and I allow its release, then what will happen is the truth will enter me as a joyful process after that or maybe during that process. And the painful process of releasing the error will also need to occur. And as long as I am not selective about pain and pleasure, it will all happen naturally. But as soon as I get selective about pain and pleasure, the entire process will shut down because God created our soul to experience all feelings and sensations, whether they are painful or pleasurable. It is by design that God did that. And we must understand that all of these principles that we're discussing are not what I'm, my ideas or concepts. They are God's design of the human soul. They are how God designed the human soul to operate. And all I need to do is come to understand it. Uh, you know, it's not my idea. I've had to come to understand it, just like I'm trying to share with other people to help them understand it. We, if we understand it, we work with it. If we don't understand it, or we deny it, or we try to work against it, the results are always going to be pain and suffering that we see. Always. Yeah. So would you like to use, <coughs> have an example for progression? Sure, sure. Let's do that. So the example <coughs> was, um, same one as we've done before. Uh, the violence, the truth is violence towards anyone is not loving. Yep. And the error is... That person made me angry, so violence towards them is justified. Okay, so now we're looking at this same situation we've looked at in the other in the other principles of the souls of the soul. We're looking at it in respect to this particular principle of progression. So, so what we're doing is we're relating progression to 
how do I progress on this issue of violence? Like, how do I actually change my soul to, <clears throat> to work through the issues that, uh, that so, so that eventually I come out the other end going, I accept in my soul and my soul feelings and emotions are all, I would never be able to be violent again. How do, how do I get to that point? That's really the question. And the answer to that is that, well, how did this violence get in the soul? How, how did this desire for violence get in the soul? Well, it got into the soul by the child being taught through a process in its childhood somewhere that violence and love go hand in hand under some circumstances and that violence is justified under some circumstances. And as a child and as an adult now, I need to understand my justifications for violence and release every single one of them if I'm truly ever going to be non-violent in my future. So, so to do that, I'm going to have to go through a process, a painful process of releasing every belief that I have of justification for violence. And I also will need to go through the joyful process of receiving the new truth of why under those circumstances there's no justification for violence. And that's a process that I'll have to go through if I want to grow or change or on the particular subject. Yeah. So what I've said here with it in terms of understanding, if a child is taught through the parent's example of treatment of the child, that a person who loves them it can also sometimes be violent with them, this teaching will have entered the child through a painful emotional process. So we can see that, right? The painful emotional process is the parent has been violent with the child and there's been physical touch usually involved in it, usually belting or some kind of violent process, which has been physically painful to the child. It's also been emotionally painful for the child because the child up until that point trusted that this parent would act in a harmony that's never violent, never unloving, and now all of a sudden they're receiving a lot of pain from this person that they trust. So there's a lot of broken feelings inside the child, emotional feelings about trust and who they can trust and what they can trust, all going on at the same time. Very painful emotional experience. That's entered the child. How is it going to be released? By the child feeling it. Now, what happened most of the time is the child wasn't allowed to feel it. The child was suppressed from feeling that. And so now that we're an adult, we're going to have to go back to that time in our life and actually feel it to release it, to release the, the, in, the, the truth that's in our soul that's actually an error from God's perspective, but it's the truth of what happened to us. We have to release it. So we have to go through the painful emotional experience of releasing it. And then we come out the other side of that painful emotional experience with our soul through this process of, of uh, absorption. Now our soul is open to receiving the truth. Our, pro our soul is now going, okay, the error's gone. What's the truth now? And the truth now can be quite easily absorbed and we can go through the pleasurable process <laughs> of realising the truth in that, after that point. Mm -hmm. Now, often, as you've pointed out, it's not a you know, thing that happens overnight on one occasion. It's a gradual this, you release this point and that point of truth or, or error, and then you absorb this point and that point of truth, and then you release that point of error and then absorb this point of truth. And often, on the, in one large subject, there may be hundreds of little subjects in which truth and error must conf will conflict and therefore while the error exists the truth won't enter so we have to release the error on that little subject for the truth to enter on that little subject and often that builds into the entire subject then being completed at some point in our future so you can't expect that to happen overnight there's no such thing as the overnight transformation of the soul and i suggested if anybody says there is then they've probably just been overcloaked by a spirit who's helped them be a completely different person, right? Because there is no such thing as the overnight transformation of the soul. So it is going to be a gradual process. But how fast it happens will depend on how much we understand our soul. If we understand our soul, you know, have these point, those points that we've been raising, we, and we, that's the way it's been designed, then we'll work in harmony with its design rather than always trying to work against it. And therefore, if we're working in harmony with it, the soul will progress quite rapidly. Yeah. 
So that's the issue of progression, progression. how progression works. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, the next point we'd like to discuss about the soul and how it operates is this point of resistance, the understanding resistance, what resistance of the soul is all about. Okay. Uh, tell me about resistance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lily. Okay. Well, let, let, let me read about resistance. Resistance is the principle that truth enters the soul when there is no emotional impediment as error resisting the absorption of the truth. Error enters the soul when there is no emotional impediment as truth, resisting the absorption of the error. Emotional impediments are under the control of the will of the individual, in that the will can be exercised to emotionally release the reason for resistance. And this is a part of humility. So here what we're defining is sort of, it's now, it's now putting together a lot of the principles that we've been talking about and determining, well, why do we become stagnant? Why do we stop progressing? What, what's the reason why progress, you know, ebbs and flows? So we've, we've discussed already now the points about progression and what, what, what's going to be needed for progression. And that's the understanding that, that we need to do some emotional work that's going to be both painful and pleasurable in the process. And there's this issue of dominance that we, we want, want, want to encourage the soul to be dominant, not suppress it. We want to encourage its emotions, not suppress them. And, and absorption states that we can't enter, have a truth enter us unless some kind of error leaves. Now, if we put all that together, every single time we get into a state of resistance, basically what it's telling us is that there's an emotional thing inside of us that's causing the resistance. It's not some kind of uh, intellectual thing that we have to go through in order to stop resisting. There's some emotion, there's some kind of emotional impediment inside of our soul. And we're using our will to hold on to it. That's, that's the principle of resistance. We are exercising our free will, this gift, that, this beautiful, precious gift that God has given our soul. We're exercising it to shut down the painful experience. And if we exercise our soul to shut down a painful experience, we are going to be resistive to, to, to anything being absorbed into the soul. Now, we can be in error and resist truth, or we can be in truth and resist error either way. Um, it's, uh, it's going to happen. And, and my suggestion is we use our will to always release error, right? And if we use our will to always release error, then we will never hit a point of resistance, right? We will never hit the point where we stagnate, where we, where we, where we slow down and stop in our progression. In actual practice, for the majority of people, we hit resistance all the time. We don't want to experience the pain of the, of the emotional error that exists in our soul. We want then to maintain intellectual dominance over our emotion. We want to avoid the process of absorption. We want to, you know, we also want to avoid progression. Now, of course, if we're avoiding all those things, the only subsequent result can be resistance, can be stagnation, can be stopping in our progress of the soul. And we need to understand the power of our will exercised in this regard. It's our will being exercised out of harmony with its design that causes us to go into a stagnation. So whenever we feel stagnant or whenever we feel resistive to absorbing new truth, if we, were, if we thought about it and go, well, hang on a sec, this isn't very clever. <laughs> we're now using our will in complete disharmony with the way in which God created our, uh, the design of our soul. Why would we do that? That's such a silly thing to do. We'd be better off definitely changing that particular course of action. And, and I feel if we understand resistance is not about anything external. So in all of this, I haven't mentioned anything that's like your fault that I can't do something. <laughs> you know, it's not your fault or ego's fault or anybody's fault that I can't do anything. It's because of my choice to exercise my will out of harmony with God's original design that causes me to go into a place of stagnation. It's not because of anything you did. It's not because of anything you tried to stop me doing. Right? I might imagine it to be, but it's not. 
Uh, the reality is I can use my will every single time. Every single time. To, to engage a place of non, no resistance. Now, if I understood that principle fully, I would probably find myself getting into less resistance, progressively less resistance as I went on. Because the more of that truth that I let enter my soul, the less I'd be tempted into resistance. Because I'd realise that there's a negative effect for any resistance. I'd realise that every time I resist something, all I am doing is working against the design of my own soul, which is not a very logical choice to make. Now, the only time when I feel that such a, a action is, um, is understandable is when we were children. Um, as you see, when we're children, we're often uh, put into situations that we cannot get out of. And, and as a result of that, we suppress certain emotions in order to cope with the situation. So, for example, sometimes as a child, we were smacked by our parents, right? Then we start crying. And then our parent tells us, if you cry anymore, I'll smack you again. Now, now that's a very confusing thing for the child because it's already experiencing the pain of the previous assault. And now it's being threatened with another assault for, for feeling the results of the previous one. Now, in that circumstance, the child will probably learn to close itself down, and that's understandable. But we're adult, when we're adults, that is not understandable to, to do that. There's no reason to make those choices as an adult, even if violence is perpetrated towards us regularly. There's no reason to continue that because we, we as an adult, understand we have the power to release, and in fact, our soul has been created to release, and as long as I release, I am working in harmony with my soul's design. Whereas as a child, we don't understand that. Nobody's taught us that, so we don't understand that. But now that we understand this truth, we can at least work in harmony with its design as an adult. So I feel the only time when, uh, when, when the process of resistance is something that you can truly understand is when a child is in resistance, rather than an adult being in resistance. Unfortunately, we often find the reverse, and that is a child is rarely in resistance unless an adult <laughs> forces it into such. And an adult is often in resistance, even when nobody is forcing them to do anything. So, um, you know, that's something that we do need to change. That's another error in the soul that needs to be released, this desire to, to, to stop the process of release. The child does not generally have a desire to stop the process of release unless it's received plenty of encouragement in that direction by its environment before that time. Whereas as an adult, living by itself or even with a partner has no reason to not release. There's no logical reason to not release. They are no longer being dominated in that circumstances by another, although they may have attracted somebody, maybe their partner who dominates them. But even so, there's still no reason to not release if they trusted the mechanism of the soul, if they trusted God's design. So if they trusted the fact that there's just one emotion they need to get rid of and then it'll all flow. Mm. It's just another feeling they have to feel. It's just another feeling. They wouldn't have this feeling of being afraid of their feelings all the time. They'd go, it's just another feeling. Even if it's fear or terror, it's just another feeling. All I need to do is release it and the error can leave me and then a new truth can enter me. I can grow if I allow this feeling to flow. And uh, they wouldn't worry so much about their feelings of what they would be. All they would do is use or exercise their mind in a loving direction to support their feeling. So they wouldn't dump their feeling on everyone around them all the time. They would, let, they would use their mind to support the processing of the feeling in a, in a way that wouldn't harm other people or themselves. That's what they would do. So they wouldn't even choose to harm themselves. They wouldn't choose to cut themselves up or hurt themselves in any way or bash themselves. They wouldn't choose to, you know, to suicide, which is, a, which is the ultimate of self-hurt, I suppose you'd say, or of self-rage. And they wouldn't choose to do any of those things because all of those things would be more out of harmony with love. They would choose just to feel the feeling, no matter how intense it is and no matter how painful it is, knowing that if I fully... Fit, if I fully express and experience this feeling, the error leaves me and now the truth can enter me and my life will change. And 
that's the beauty. So, so resistance, um, I suppose we could say resistance is futile. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but the reality is most of us don't believe that. Most of us believe that resistance is a powerful place. That we can avoid it, our pain forever, and it's not going to control our lives yeah. and everything that happens to us. But if I truly understood dominance, then I would also understand that resistance is futile. Because sooner or later, if, in, if there is error and pain in my soul, it's going to have to come out. It's going to come out one way or another. And I can either aid that process in a, in a, in a logical and coherent way. I can aid it, like use my mind to aid the process. Or I can suppress the process and fight it for the rest of my existence, which means it's just going to take longer. That's all. I can do one or the other. Now, it's not very logical to make something take 10 years that could take one year. And it's not very logical to make something take a thousand years when it could have taken one year. And my suggestion is with resistance, notice when you're in resistance. You're in resistance every time you exercise your will to deny a painful experience. You're in resistance. And you'll also be denying pleasure in that place because the soul is not able to distinguish feelings between pain and pleasure and, and selectively feel them without using the mind. And we're saying the mind can no longer be dominant. What we're saying is the soul needs to be allowed to experience its thing. It needs to do its stuff. And the only way we're going to allow it to do its stuff is by allowing it to feel everything, which includes its pain and its pleasure. And if we try to shut down either, we are going to be creating a major problem for our soul in the future and a major problem in terms of our development of our soul. Our soul cannot develop while it's being shut down in one or the other or both directions. Yeah. So I'd encourage people to notice when they're resistive. Like quite often, you know, a person says, comes up and says to me, oh, I haven't done much progress in the last year and I'm not really sure why that is. I'm saying, why aren't you sure? You're obviously in resistance. You should be sure of what is creating your resistance. Like I know what's creating my resistance. Why don't you know what's creating so yours? So it's one or the other. Basically, you're in resistance or you're progressing. That's right. You're either resistant or you're progressing. There's no real, you know, there's no real middle state from those two places. You're either in progression and fully engaging progression or you're in resistance. And sometimes you can be in resistance on one issue and progressing on another. That is possible. But, but when it comes to each issue individually, you're either in resistance or you're in progression. Which one? You know? and, and my suggestion to people is at least know why you're in resistance. At least know. <laughs> don't, don't ignore it. Don't, don't try to make out that you're not when you are because nothing will happen then. If you make out that you're doing something that you're not doing, of course nothing can happen. So be real about it. I know that I'm resisting this issue. Work out why. Use your mind to find the reasons why you're in resistance to this issue and then allow, once you become aware of the emotions involved, allow the emotions to be processed so that you're no longer in resistance. The soul's natural state is to grow. It's like, again, we can do an analogy with nature. You plant a tree, it would make no sense to put a complete structure around the tree that would normally grow 30, 40, 50 metres high and to put a structure around the tree so the tree could only grow one metre high and then to do everything possible to stop the growth of the tree. But that's what we're doing with our souls. Our soul is made to grow. God designed it that way, to grow. To our, actually, God designed our soul to exponentially grow continuously infin at infinitum. That's how God created our soul. So it's not like our soul is limited to be 50 metres high. Our soul is, is not limited and not a limited creature if we receive divine love. So why would you choose to limit it? That can only be an error of some kind that would cause such a choice. So find it and release it. Don't live with it because while you're living it, you're, 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 you're putting structures around your soul to constrain it. And that's going to damage its development. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to ever resist, it, and particularly knowingly resist. I do that plenty. 
Well, you, well, find the reason. My suggestion would be to find the reason why. What, what is it about growth that is challenging or what, why do you wish to resist? What is it? And for a lot of people, generally, it's the pain. It's the resistance. The, it's the fear of pain. Right? Not understanding that pain is a healing process. When you release it and experience pain, it's a healing process. Most people still resist pain. And, and as a result of that, they can't grow. You know, that, that's why they get resistive. They, many people, I also find, are not coping with overwhelm. They're not coping with being overwhelmed emotionally. To grow in its ex emotional expression, your soul must be overwhelmed. So that's how it gets stretched. It's, it's sort of like getting a balloon and deciding to not put any air in it which is what we often do with our soul. Our soul is made to stretch and expand, infinitely in fact. And, and yet many of us don't blow the air in to get that process started. We're not, we're not assisting the process. We're afraid of its growth as much as we're afraid of its shrinking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes no logical sense either, if you think about it, because our soul is designed to grow. So... So while I'm restricting it, I am working or attempting to work against its own design, what God has put into it, the design that God has made. So it makes sense instead to start filling it with air, you know, filling it with something and to make it, to help it grow. And to grow, it's going to have to stretch. It's going to have to stretch and in fact, as we receive divine love, we stretch even beyond our original capacity to stretch. Uh, that's how God created our soul, that we can be turned into a new divine creature through the reception of divine love. So we need to allow for the fact that we're going to not only stretch to what we were originally created to be, but we can also stretch beyond that capacity infinitely. Now, that can't happen if I'm resistive to being overwhelmed. If I'm, if I'm constantly going, I don't want to get overwhelmed. I want to receive a new truth, but I don't want to be overwhelmed by it. And, I, and I'm timid with regard to the reception of new truth in that regard. Then what's going to happen is uh, I'll be constantly resisting progression. So I'll be in resistance most of the time. And that makes no sense at all. We're working against our design, the design of our soul when we're in resistance. It is far better to understand the principles of resistance and go, okay, there it is again, I'm in resistance. <laughs> Find out why. Use your will to discover why. Use your will in a positive direction to assist your soul in its growth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. should we, can we um, use the example again? Sure, yeah, the resistance. same example same of violence. Example. Yeah. So yeah. the truth was that violence towards anyone is not loving mm -hmm. and the error is that that person has made me angry, so violence towards them is justified. Okay, now we're looking at this principle with respect to resistance. So what we're saying here now is that the person who's thinking these things is resistive to letting go of the error that violence is justified. So that's what they'd be doing. They'd be saying, I don't see any point in letting go of this. The truth is that there are times when violence is justified and the truth is if, you, if your child was being hurt, you would revert to violence. I know you would, you know, and they come up with all these ex arguments, which is just basically an expression of their rage of accepting the truth that violence is never justified. Now, while they are expressing their rage of accepting the truth, they're never going to release the error. The error is still going to remain within them whatever the error is that causes them to think that way, is going to remain for good unless they have less resistance to accepting the, 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 the need to release the error. So, so it's one thing to acknowledge this is how I feel. It's quite another thing to justify holding on to it. Right? So it's one thing for me to acknowledge, yes, I do have emotions in me where I do feel violence is justified under certain, okay, on certain conditions. That's one thing. It's quite another thing to justify the, the reasons for my holding on to those particular emotions. Right? And what I'm suggesting is a person in resistance will justify holding on to the error. And, and it's unjustifiable. There's no logical reason for doing it. And, but, but obviously they believe there is one, but there is no. 
There is no logical reason for holding on to such an error. Now, a person who wants to overcome resistance would use their will instead to go, wow, I really want to hold on to this error. Like, I really want to hold on to it. I, I really want it to be the truth. I, I want to believe that there's times when violence is justified. And then if they allowed themselves to think about that and use their mind and their will to find out the reasons why, they would soon come to the conclusions of why they want to believe that. And there'll be all sorts of emotions involved in that, right the way through to unjust, unjust things that happened in their past that they would really like to get the person back for what happened to them in the past. There, there'd be unreleased hurt about the unjust things that have happened in their past that causes them to feel that way. There might be unreleased hurt about sexual matters such as sexual abuse and, and rape and those kind of issues. There might be unreleased emotional hurt about violence, you know, that, that has been perpetrated towards them. Towards them. And, and if they were truly honest about that and wanted to get out of resistance, they'd be willing to go to those emotions. Yep. If not, they will continually justify their position. And, and this is what I find happening quite regularly with people in resistance. You know, they, they come up to you and they say, I'm in resistance. And you go, OK. No worries. Well, it's no problem being in resistance. That's not the problem. The problem is wanting to stay there. <laughs> That's the problem. So what are you in resistance about? And they say, oh, well, I'm in resistance about the fact that, you know, I don't want to accept that I've treated my children badly. I go, OK. Well, how are your children treating you now? Oh, well, they're not very happy with me, actually. <laughs> they all feel that I've treated them badly, right? OK, um, so you're resistive to acknowledging that fact. And how's it working out with your relationship with your children? Well, not very good, obviously, right? Because they'll be feeling one thing and you're, you're acting another. Not very, not very good. So why do you want to hold on to this? Why, why do you want to hold on to this concept, this, this concept that it's justified that you treated them badly? Or that you even don't think you've treated them badly at all, you're in complete denial. Why do you want to hold on to this? When it's being reflected to you in the course of your day through God's law of attraction, it's being reflected to you all the time. Why do you want to hold on to that concept? And oftentimes they'll get down to the feelings of guilt and shame they have and other different emotions if, they, if they're willing. If they're not willing, they'll fight. Well, I, got, you know, I only knew what I only knew then and I, you know, I know better now, of course, and, but, but back then I didn't know better and, and I, can't, I shouldn't be blamed for things that I didn't know and the, now all of their errors are coming out. Their unwillingness to take personal responsibility for actions they've taken in their life that were based around an ignorant position, for example, which is, which is part of the error that they've just expressed. And they are unwilling to accept these errors that they are actually errors within them still that stop them from accepting the truth. And so my suggestion would, to them would be choose differently. Use your will, choose differently. Choose to see the error, choose to acknowledge it, choose to firstly intellectually acknowledge it, but, for, but secondly feel it, feel the error. And a lot of it is about repentance. A lot of it is about a person's resistance to repentance. You see, we are very happy to acknowledge that somebody else done something to us. Usually we're quite happy about that. <laughs> we're not so happy to forgive them because we feel that that's letting them off the hook for what they've done. So we're not happy about that. But when it comes to our being sorry for what we have done to others, the majority of people have huge resistance to that. And that is usually the com most common cause of resistance in our soul. The most common reason for us to not progress is because we don't want to acknowledge what we have done. So it's, <clears throat> it's sort of like not taking personal responsibility exactly. for everything in our soul. And, and not taking responsibility for the fact that not only have we created pain in our own soul, but we've also created pain in, the other, in other souls as a result of our choices and decisions. Now, if I understood resistance and I didn't ever want to get into resistance and I understood progression, I'd be willing to go through the process of repentance. I'd be willing to work out the reasons why I chose to take such actions that I chose that obviously harmed others and myself. I'd be willing to look at those particular things. So I would not be willing to stay in a state of resistance. 
but, but if I don't honour my soul and I don't honour what God has created, I may stay in states of resistance for thousands of years. And in fact, in the spirit world, the main reason why people do not progress has nothing to do with belief systems. It has everything to do with their unwillingness to repent and forgive. That's the main reason why people stay stagnant for thousands of years in their soul progression. It's not even because of the way they exercise their mind. It's because of their unwillingness to feel specific emotions of repentance and forgiveness in particular that cause them to, to not be able to progress. So if we understood resistance and we understood progression in the soul, we'd be pretty resistive to uh, you know, holding back our own progression. In other words, we, 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 whenever, whenever we felt inclined to be resistive, we'd be looking very carefully, like with a magnifying glass, at the reason why we're trying to be resistive instead of just trying to brush over it all the time and make it go away and try to justify it and minimise it and shift the blame to somebody else, we'd be constantly on the lookout for our points of resistance because it's our points of resistance that will eventually prevent our relationship with God. It's not going to be the truths we accept that prevent our relationship with God. It's going to be the errors that we're unwilling to release that cause the injury to our relationship with God and also cause the injury to our relationship with ourselves and, and our friends and, and partner and children and everyone else in our life. It is our resistance that is going to cause that damage. So my suggestion to people is understand resistance. Understand your will is being exercised to shut down this process, to shut down the process of absorption, to shut down the process of understanding how progression occurs in the soul. And, and use your will differently. Actively choose to use it differently. And use your mind, instead of using your mind to deny you've ever done anything wrong and using your mind to deny that something is wrong or using your mind to minimise it or shift the blame onto somebody else or take, and not take responsibility yourself, use your mind in a completely different direction to aid your soul's progression, not to limit it or inhibit your soul's progression. Yep. And I feel that if people understood the principle of resistance, they would, never re they, would, they would never get into periods of resistance. They'll get into moments of resistance, you know, maybe for a day or two, day or two maybe. Uh, but they would never get into periods that last years and years and years of their life of resistance if they understood the damage that it does to the progression of their soul. Mm. Yeah. You had a question? Uh, I was just going to say, and the resistances can be reason upon reason upon reason upon reason upon reason. Of course. Uh, often they are <coughs> constructed in layers. Um, and remember that resistance is about emotional impediment. So it's emotional reason upon emotional reason upon emotional reason. Yeah. It's not just intellectual argument. It's every one of these intellectual arguments comes from an emotional impediment, from an emotional reason why we're arguing for the error. So, so when I see people arguing for the error, that is a direct indication that they want to hold on to resistance. Of course, you're going to harm your own soul holding on to resistance and harm the soul of others while you're holding on to resistance. And understand that your resistance is caused by the emotional desire to hold on to the impediment that is causing the resistance to truth. So, so why would you want to exercise your emotions in that, in that direction? Feel the emotional reason why instead. So, so, for example, you might get down to the fact, for example, that you don't want to tell the truth in all situations because you're just scared of people and what they'll do. <laughs> so instead of going into resistance and justifying, well, they'll attack me and they'll do this and they'll do that to me and they'll just make my life a misery if I tell the truth, so I'm better off not telling the truth. That's all just justification of the error. That's justification of you holding on to the emotional impediment. How about using your mind in the completely opposite direction? Say, there is no justification to me holding on to this emotional impediment and let myself feel that they will hurt me and feel that they will attack me and feel that my life will be... And go through the feelings of that because they're obviously in me. That's, what, that, that's the impediment 
that's causing the resistance, right? So understand that it's the emotional impediment and I need to feel the emotional impediment. So I feel my anger at the fact that they'll attack me and feel my anger at the fact that they'll hurt me and, and all these kind of things and let myself release the feelings and get down to the grief that's underneath them to the point where I've released it and then I go, well, I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't believe anymore that if I tell the truth, I'm going to be hurt all the time. You know, I said to Mary recently that myself and Mary live in different worlds when it comes to the truth because, because I know that telling the truth all the time will always benefit me and everyone around me and I feel it all the time. It's, a, it's directly reflected to me all the time. We, I have wonderful conversations with people where they connect to the truth and they go away feeling changed, you know. Mary has the opposite occurring all right, many of the time, much of the time because she's afraid of people and how they'll react to the truth, right? And as a result of that, she, she's, she's sometimes, up until quite recently, was justifying not telling the truth. And now she's working through the emotional impediment to doing that, which is her fear of people's violent, abusive reaction. Right? So feel the fear of their violent, abusive reaction. Once you've released that emotional impediment to telling the truth, you will have no resistance to telling the truth. It'll just be a natural process because you've released the emotional impediment that creates the resistance. And that's what we need to understand when it comes to resistance. Yep. Mm. Okay. Yep, that's Thanks. good. Thanks for that discussion, Liddy. We'll move on to our next. <laughs> like, what I'm finding with logic, emotions and truth is that the emotions inside people just prevent them from being logical. They can't think clearly. And it was interesting, I was talking to, I think Mary recorded that actually. We talked to a group of spirits about logic. And, um, oh, the atheist one. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, they were saying how it's very unusual to find a person who's emotional, who's logical. And they couldn't understand why I was so logical. Because, because it, I wasn't logical through the exercise of my intellect like they were. Yeah. Yeah, and I do find that people do struggle when I enter into a logical discussion of a subject. Do you know, do you know what I mean? They really struggle with the logic. Sometimes yeah. it can seem a bit conceptual until you put on... That's where I put struggle, in, I think, uh, put it into an into example. An analogy or some kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it can be a bit like... Oh. I guess because you're not going, oh, you're going, oh, from yourself, right? So, yeah, no, it sort, yeah. Of, it, it sort of feels to me sometimes like there's thousands of subjects and sometimes when I choose an analogy, it feels a bit lame in comparison to the topic, you know? Oh. And so, yeah. I feel the logic, you can't contradict it, you know? And when you say it, well, the, people can't, can't challenge you on that and they feel... Well, they can, but they, they use. They're riddled with fear. But they use illogical argument to counter the logic. But that's the thing. Like that yeah. conversation I had with my neighbour, who just went on and on and on and on and on about me being in a cult. And I was like, on and on. <laughs> like I said so many things, and he was just convinced that you know I just wasn't advanced enough to have all the nasty things happen to me that happened to him when he joined some group and. Um, <laughs> And had these, you know, spirit attack. And he felt like spirits were climbing up his abdomen and stuff Ooh. like that. I know. Yeah. And he was like, oh, you're just not I mean, advanced enough yet. It's going to happen to you. And I was like, it's really, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. <laughs> and just, oh, it was just, it was just. A circular. Like, no matter what I said, it was, it was never going to change yeah. his mind. Because, because a person who's embroiled in their unhealed emotion is incapable of being logical. Yeah. Is the truth so can't enter them. Riddled with fear. Yeah, and if yeah. you're you're riddled with the emotional impediment, you can't accept any. Like it, you know, sometimes when I'm giving a discussion or a talk with people, and I come up one example, and I just feel the audience totally blocked to that. So come up with no example, the audience totally blocked to that. Come up, and all I'm trying to do is look for emotion, look for examples that I can feel in the audience where there's going to be some emotional openness. Does that make sense? Like. And there is sometimes an example that you can come up. And I know that once I'm at one, we've got to be able to go, I know the exact example that's going to create, if anything's going to create emotional emotion, this is going to be the example. Because you, know you can feel everybody. Because you can feel everybody collectively. And, 
it's hard in a group because obviously everyone has their own emotional impediment. So, so we can include this in the discussion actually. The emotional impediments are interesting. You, the resistances are interesting because the emotional impediments are sort of like, they're like doorways in the soul. You could think of them as. And it's sort of like the door is closed, the door is closed, the door is closed. Like, and until some opening occurs on that particular front, that door is never going to open. But there might be a slightly variant truth that you can present where there's a door slightly open in the same soul on a, on a, on a, on a related subject. And you might, so you might use one analogy and the doors totally closed and they don't even get it, the analogy at all. And then you use another analogy and the door's totally closed to that analogy because they don't get an, that analogy at all because of their emotional impediments. But then there's this third analogy that where the door, because they've had a bit of emotional processing where they've released a bit of error or no error entered them on a particular subject and the door's slightly open. Now when you say the third thing, you go, oh, they go, oh, oh, I know what you mean now. You know, like... <laughs> I had that one yesterday, something you said to me. Oh, yeah. now I get now it. Now I get it. <laughs> like, and, that, and that's because the, uh, with this I issue of resistance, the, there's the resistance, the emotional impediment, creating a resistance, and there's an unwillingness to address the emotional impediment or even know what it is in most cases. And then the unwillingness, unwillingness. And then all of a sudden you hit one that's actually open, like a door that's partly ajar, you know, and, and straight away there's a connection. And that's the beauty of understanding absorption is that when you understand that you've got part openness in a certain location, you won't bother having a conversation with a person unless they're partly open in a certain location. In other words, you know, so the example you just gave of the man who w wanted to try to convince you you're in a cult and you're telling him, I'm not a cult, I don't have any of those experiences. He's had a lot of bad experiences which are driving his emotions about it all, of course. But, and we've got to acknowledge that. And in fact, in, if you acknowledge that, you might have got further with him. That you've had a lot of bad experiences, and I oh, understand I did. the emotion. Yeah, it so didn't I, work. No, that didn't, that didn't work. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, that door wasn't open either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, he's trying to try to convince you you're going to have the same experience through, you know, and, and of course it's not possible. But he's going to try to convince you of such. And unless there's a door open somewhere in this discussion around that particular subject where there is a point of entry where, you, where a thought that you are presenting as truth can actually enter his soul, he will not be able to accept any of it. So, so nothing will ever be absorbed. So, and what I find under those circumstances that it, it's basically totally useless having a conversation with that person. On that I, subject. I reached that conclusion at yeah. the end because yeah. in the end he, he'd reached the conclusion that everything in, on the planet, any form of spirituality was evil yeah. and corrupt and they're yeah. all like in this big conspiracy theory yeah. and the only thing that was safe was Christianity. Yeah. So then I started talking about some of the flaws in that yeah. and I didn't get anywhere there. I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> I give up. I give up totally yeah. now. Exactly. Yeah. There were no holes in anywhere to him. There were, there were only emotional impediments, only resistance in every course of action. And, and so what... What you find after a while, the more sensitive you become at in your own soul, is you instantly feel whether there is an openness in the person in any direction. And you are able to engage that openness instantly by saying the right words and leading them down a certain path instantly. And if there is no emotional openness in any direction with regard to truth, then you won't even bother engaging the conversation because it's pointless. It's just pointless. No, nothing you do, nothing you say will actually change that person's mind. Even nothing you do, even if you love them to bits, they're not going to change their mind like, because there's, the emotional impediments prevent them from doing so. And this is where I feel, you know, if you understand resistance in yourself and you start understanding resistance in other people, what eventually happens is you know which conversations to engage and which conversations to just walk away from. Because, it, because it's pointless in wasting your time on conversations where there is no emotional openness, only resistance in every direction you take. Yeah. And it's interesting how people will often ask a question with no desire at all to have it be emotionally open to the answer. Yeah. And that yeah, after a while you start feeling that as well, that it's pointless addressing the question, as uh, answering the actual question 
you need to firstly address the reason why they're not emotionally open to the question, the answer to the question. So they're just asking a question for another motive? Yeah, like many members of the media, for example, have asked me questions only to make statements. So they're really just oh, making okay. statements of their own by yeah. asking a question. They don't want or expect or even encourage me to answer it or give me the time to answer it because they don't have any interest in hearing the answer. They only have an interest in hearing the question. Yeah, I watched one of the recent <laughs> ones recently that was a bit like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and many people are like that, where they, there is no ultimate desire to know the answer to any of the questions they're asking. They're only asking the question because they want to be able to say, I asked that question and he couldn't answer it. You know, like that's all that they want to say. Um, and, it's, and, and they remind me a lot of the Pharisees in the first century to, in that regard. That, that was the purpose of the Pharisees' questioning. They always had an ulterior motive to their questions. And, uh, and a person who's got ulterior motives to their questions is never going to be self-reflective and they're never going to be able to grow their soul. They are constantly in resistance. So my suggestion to, to anybody who wants to share truth with others is you know, feel the soul of the person, feel where they're emotionally open and engage conversation in that direction. And uh, usually a person, a, a sincere person, is generally emotionally open in some direction, you know, of some kind. Um, but as you know, there are times when you find a person who's not emotionally open in any direction at all except for something physical, you know. In, in other words, they're not emotionally open to any spiritual conversation or, or, or direction of truth that you could take, mm. which is sad for them. Yeah. Anyway, that brings us to our six, uh, point, six point that we wanted to discuss today, and that was this uh, point of understanding presence. And here we're talking about the presence of love along with truth. So if I can define it, as I've written it here, it says, presence is the principle that for truth to be present and absorbed by the soul love must also be present. So it's a very simple principle. So you often hear of people who are telling somebody the truth, but they're screaming at them <laughs> while they're telling them the truth. You know. Now, under those circumstances, it's very, very difficult for the person who's on the receiving end of that to actually accept anything they're saying as truth because love is not present. The principle of presence is not being adhered to. So the, this principle of presence as it affects the soul is this. The soul can feel when love is the underlying intention of the, the discovery of truth. And the soul can also feel when the underlying intention is not love, but a manipulation of truth. Right? And as a result of that, if we're sensitive to presence, the presence of love in discussion of truth, then we'll be able to easily determine when a person's out of harmony with love while they're discussing truth. And therefore, which also, and that also means that the truth is probably not the truth, the absolute truth. It's only their version of the truth. And when we understand that, we understand who to listen to. Listen to the people who want to help you grow your soul and who have a feeling of love towards your soul. Listen to those people, no matter what they say and how confronting it is. Listen. But don't listen to the people who say they love you and tell you a whole heap of truth, but it, but it really is without the presence of love. It's all done for an ulterior motive that you can feel, an ulterior motive of maybe pulling you down or humiliating you, making you feel bad or controlling your will or whatever other type of thing they might be attempting to do. If, if a person has love present in the discussion of truth with you, and this is a, remember this is a factor regarding the soul and its absorption of the truth. If love is present, then allow the absorption of the information. If love is not present, then be very selective to the absorption of the information. Because if you allow the absorption of information when love is not present, there's a high likelihood the ulterior motive will actually damage your soul. The ulterior motive of the person projecting their particular truth to you will, will eventually be exposed. And it's quite easy to expose a person who does not have presence. It's quite easy to expose their ulterior motive in the end. 
And so what I've got here are a number of different, what I would classify as things to consider with regard to presence. Um, in terms of if a person loves you, what would they do? And if they don't love you, what would they do? And, and, and if we understand that, we would then allow our soul, no matter how challenged it is, to at least listen to, and even our mind at least to listen to, the presentation of truth. If we understand that love has to be present in order for truth to be absorbed, then what we will come to understand within ourselves is we will create an environment of love around us that only absorbs truth because of love. And what I, the reason why this is so important is because many people are being affected by very dark influences, both spiritual and physical. When I say dark influences, they are influenced by the dark reflections, intellectual and emotional reflections of people on earth, and they are influenced by the dark influences of, and emotional reflections of people in the spirit world. And the reason why they are influenced by these things is because they do not understand the principle of presence. That, that if we allow a person who is in an unloving state to tell us truths, and we allow the absorption of such truths, and I use the word truths here in quotations because they're not really truths. If we allow such a thing to occur, there's, there is the potential of further damage to our soul. That's the principle of presence. If love is present, then there will not be the potential of further damage to our soul if we listen to the person, even if what we're listening to is false. Right? It won't damage our soul because we'll be able to recognise it sooner or later as false. If love is present, it is beautiful having a conversation with something, even if they are in a state of untruth. It's beautiful to continue a conversation with them if love is present. Because it's love that is the guiding factor of the absorption of all things into the soul. If we want to grow in love, and remember this is all about the soul's progression, and when we talk about soul progression, we're talking about the soul progressing in love every single time. So if I'm in an environment where I'm discussing something with you and I feel the presence of love, then I'm in a safe environment for the discussion of this matter, whether it's truth or not. I'm still in a safe environment. If love is not present in the discussion of this particular truth, now I'm no longer in a safe environment for its discussion. Whether truth is being discussed or not, I'm not in a safe environment for its discussion. So this is what I find happening a lot in our seminars. What I find is that people often asking me for more truth while at the same time treating me unlovingly. Love isn't present. What's the point of discussing more truth? So the love has to be present for both parties? Yes. Yes. In any discussion, the love has to be, for all parties, really, it has to be present. Or if in the case of a group, the majority of people, it needs to be present. If it's not present, then the absorption of truth is impossible. To so occur. why is that? If we look back to the absorption of truth, what we talked about earlier, you, you release the error, the truth can come in. Mm -hmm. how, how does that, this impact on that? Well, this impacts upon your choice to receive truth. Does that make sense? Into your soul. You see, you see if love is not present, you would be very unwise to choose to accept what the person is saying to you because there's a chance that their motivations, and there's a very high chance, of course, that their motivations are unloving, because love is not present. If love is present, then why would you resist what they're saying, no matter what it is? There's no need to resist it, because there is love that is present. Now, even if they're speaking in error, if love is present, you can still have a conversation. You can still engage the conversation. If you know a different truth to what they know, and there is love present, then you can have a free and easy conversation with them about the issue. And there's a high likelihood that at some point in the discussion, truth will be arrived at. Right? But if love is not present in the interaction between the people involved, then what ha is happening is there's an automatic impediment to any truth 
entering the souls of all the people involved. So what's the point of saying a truth under those circumstances when the person is also being unloving right in that moment? All development of the soul is about love. Like love is the thing that causes true development. So if I ignore love in my discussion of truth, I am ignoring the reason for discussing truth. That makes sense, doesn't it? And, and if I'm ignoring the reason for discussing truth, then of course there is little point to discussing truth. Because the only real reason for discussing truth is so that we can obtain more love, that we can become more loving. As a result of becoming more loving, we'll know more as a result and we'll be able to feel more, where our soul will expand. Remember, the soul's expansion is the expansion in its ability to love. And if I'm discussing truth with you with no desire at all to become more loving, then I've lost my point. I've lost the point of all soul progression. This is why it's important that love is present. Because without love being present, I have lost the point of all discussion of truth. All discussion of the truth is for the expansion of love, not for its degradation, not for its withdrawal. And this is why it's important for me to understand the principle of presence and the effect that it has on my soul. This is why it's also easier for anybody who is in the room with somebody who is loving to actually hear what they've got to say. So you know how uh, sometimes in a group, you'll, and you've been present at some of the groups that we've been at, where you know, I get questioned by a person who's bombastic or, or you know, angry or resistive, and, and sometimes I answer the question, not because of their presence of love, but because of the presence of love that I feel in the room. But other times I feel no presence of love in the room towards the individual and no presence in love of the person towards myself. And I feel like now I've got to deal with the emotion. The emotion that they have is the first thing I have to address. I can't answer the question until this emotion is addressed, this reason for their unloving behaviour is addressed. Because otherwise it's not beneficial to anybody. It's not beneficial to anybody in the room. And I, sometimes I've had in the room one person being angry and resistive, and this happened, is a good example is any recordings you would have seen of some of the events in Sweden the first time we went there. There was a person in the room in the second discussion there that, who, who was not present in love, and he was just wanting to attack, 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 and be bombastic and attack and so forth. And as a result of that, eventually other people around him started attacking him. <laughs> and now... Now, initially, while he was attacking me, I was okay and comfortable with trying to address the issues, right? Because at least present, there was a presence of love in others and they could at least see the truth. But once the others started attacking him, now there's no presence of love whatsoever. Now I had to stop the whole thing and talk to him about his unloving behaviour and talk to the rest of the audience about their unloving behaviour before I could continue because, because all were resistive to truth. Now, when I did that, the others who projected the unloving behaviour towards the man involved started to feel the truth of what hit them and they became present again with love. They started to feel some compassion and they started to feel some uh, repentance for their own action and as a result of that they felt more loving and now I could re-engage the man again and, and discuss the actual issue with him. And so these are things that happen in, a, in interactions with people. When there's love present, at least even a little bit of love present, you have the ability for people to absorb some truth. If love is not present at all, it's very difficult. It requires a highly developed person to absorb truth when love is not present. So someone who's so humble that they'll just look at whatever their part is in the negative events that are going on around them. Exactly. It takes a very developed individual to do that, um, to, to just continually examine themselves and allow their emotions, allow their feelings and allow their expression and allow all of these qualities of the soul that we've, uh, we've talked about, allow the dominance of their soul, allow the, you know, the progression of their soul right in the situation. It, it requires a very developed person to do that in an environment where there is no love. So, so if we wish to make it easier for ourselves and others to progress in, and, and consider that all progress is progress in love, then obviously love needs to be present when discussing truth. 
So that's the best thing to do. Make sure love is present when discussing truth. If you can't do that, then it's going to require a lot of very, very good development on the part of the people who remain there to stay there without getting angry or resentful or resistive. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, some of the issues that I've raised here were issues regarding, for example, a person who does not, uh, a person who honours the loving principles of the soul free will and who wishes to say, share some truth under all circumstances will be able to tell you the truth about yourself if and only if they have learned in their soul the same truth within their selves. So I can only tell you a truth about yourself that I have come to accept inside of myself, in my soul. I can't tell you a truth that I can intellectually see that I personally ha have, right, as a problem inside of my soul. I can attempt to, but I'll have all sorts of problems with it, as we'll point out. The person will be able to logically describe the truth and define how it is the truth. So they'll be able to tell you why what they're saying is the truth and how it's the truth. They won't be going blah, 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 so every time like, you ask. Oh, you're unloving. Oh, you're it's unloving. A, and you say, how on. am I loving? Oh, you're just unloving. How am I unloving? Oh, you're just unloving. Well, there's a person who has no idea why you're unloving. And so there's a high potential you're not unloving. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're not describing to you why, you're, why they believe you're unloving because they're unable to. They're unable to because they don't have the truth about it in their soul. That's why they're unable to. They will only be able to describe why you're unloving by having the truth in their soul and therefore being able to tell why you're unloving. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yep. They will be able to tell you why the condition of error exists within you. So they'll be able to say, this is the truth, this is why it's the truth, and this is the error you have, and this is why it's the error, and this is why you have this error. You have this error because this event happened in your childhood. They'll be able to feel the events, in fact, as to what created these errors inside of you. And they will have compassion for the error that's inside of you and its creation. They'll be able to show you how to remove the condition of error from your soul. So they'll be able to give you instructions, if, the, if you ask them, about how to actually let go of this error that's in your soul, what you actually need to do to process the error in your soul. And they'll be able to do all of that while still honouring your free will. So they won't be browbeating you and trying to control you and manipulate you and push you around while they're doing that. They'll honour every choice and decision you made during the discussion. And on top of that, they'll be able to do that and stay in a condition of love themselves. That's a person who's present. So that person has to be quite... Well, they have to be very well developed on that particular point. On that particular point, yes. Right. That's correct. And it might not mean they're very developed on another point, but at least on that particular point they have to be very developed, yes. And remember, everyone's development is different on particular points. So, you know, it is possible for that to occur. Although generally what happens is that People who are not present generally on one point are often not present on many points. They're not, love isn't present within them on most points, in fact. And the reason why is because they've got some very low development of, of their soul and they're using their intellect to discuss truth and they are very unaware of their soul's development. And when they're unaware of their soul's development, they're also unaware of the lack of love that their soul portrays in the discussion of truth. They, they don't even believe they're being unloving when they're being totally unloving. I've, I've had Christians and others yelling and screaming at me and I say, well, you're being very unloving now and they don't believe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because they can't, their soul is not yet even sensitive to their, their own expression of violence. Yeah. So if we look at the, uh, the opposite to that, the flip side of that, the inverse of that, we can see that a person who does not have truth within themselves and who does not honour the loving principles of free will and so forth, will have a completely opposite effect in their discussion with you. For example, they will attempt to denigrate you with their truth. So instead of upholding you and trying to promote your development, they're trying to pull you down and tug you down and make you feel worse about yourself, right? And they're trying to overtly do that. It's not something that you just feel. It's something they're obviously trying to do. So remember that sometimes when a person tells us the truth, we feel they're attacking us when they're not really. 
But there are times when it's pretty obvious that the person's just trying to pull you down now. And most of the time they'll tell you, you know, that you're an idiot and you're this and you're that. And all the, they'll use all the words <laughs> attempting to pull you down, which is a part of the fact that they wish to just denigrate you and condescend to you and belittle you. And if they wish to denigrate, condescend and belittle you, they are not present with love. They are, they are present with a lot of evil and dark emotions, which they would need to address if they really wanted to become present. They're not present in love. It's highly unwise for me, if I'm in the reception of that, to actually listen to what they've got to say, to actually value anything they've got to say. So an example of this is like last week I had spirits telling me I was completely useless all week. Yeah. And, and I was taking it on. Yes. See, if you were, if you were honoured presence, you wouldn't have taken it on. Well, I didn't even realise it wasn't me until halfway through the week and then something changed and then I was like, oh, it's Well, even, even if it was you, you would still not do it. No, Because no. you would honour yeah. presence. Yeah. <laughs> Does I, that make sense? Yeah, I wasn't loving myself. Exactly. So yeah. pre presence is immaterial of who's in there. And if it, even if you're there alone, presence is, I must love myself while I acknowledge my error. You see? And while, if I'm attacking myself while I'm acknowledging my error, I'm not present. I'm not present with love. Even if it's just me, myself, I'm not present with love. How can I grow in that state? I'm not. And of course that state's going to encourage a whole heap of dark spirits to come and dump on you as well and dump their emotional crap on you and, and cause you to uh, cause less presence of love to be, to be there while you're trying to accept the truth. And, and the reality is you weren't accepting a truth. You're not a bad person at all. You're the pinnacle of God's creation, right? And all you're doing is you're punishing yourself for something that you perceive as wrong about yourself. And, uh, and many times we create our own lack of presence, our own lack of presence of love. Through our own lack Through of self-love. Through our own self -love. lack of self-love, yeah. And that's a point of resistance to work on. That's a point of resistance to work on. Why am I resisting loving myself? There's a, that's a very, very important question to answer. Because if I resist loving myself, of course everyone around me is going to resist loving me. <laughs> That's probably what going to be what I attract. So, so very important for me to be present with love with myself. Even if no one else is there, I need to be present with love with myself. Whenever I'm not, I need to recognise that that behaviour is out of harmony with soul progression. It's out of harmony with the development of my soul and the growth of my soul. I need to see that. Every time I attack myself, I need to see what I'm doing to myself. I am not being present with love with myself. So, yeah, often we, we revert to this behaviour even towards ourselves alone. <laughs> Which is a problem, obviously. It is. <laughs> it doesn't make you feel very good. No, I mean, we don't need anybody else to do it to us because we do it to ourselves enough, right? <laughs> And that is an indication of a lack of personal presence where we're not personally present with love with us. And so what we need to do is address the emotional reasons why that's the case. We need to become present with love, even towards ourselves, if we truly want to grow. Yeah. So the person will also have no logical idea or concept as to why their truth is the truth. <laughs> And so often you'll ask them, well, why is that the truth? And then they'll present and I'll say, I can't agree with that because of this and this and this. And then they start getting angry and then they start belittling your character again. You know, like they revert to belittling your character or tearing down your character. These are the kinds of people who are not worth listening to. Now, you might just sit there and put up with it, maybe, given the you, know, you might have to if you're in prison doing it. <laughs> but you don't have to absorb it. It doesn't have to enter you. It doesn't have to go into your soul because, because the reality is love is not present when they're doing this. They won't be able to tell you why the condition of error exists within you. They won't be able to tell you what childhood event or what things happened inside of you. You're right with the time? Yep. Um, they, won't, you won't be able to, they won't be able to tell you any of those things. They won't be able to tell you why. They won't be able to tell you how to remove the condition of error. They won't be able to tell you that either. They won't be able to tell you, and they won't honour your free will while they're doing it. They'll try to browbeat you into submission. These are the kind of principles of a person who is not present. And a person who is not present does not honour the fact that love needs to be present in the discussion of all truth. And love needs to be present if the soul is going to progress and the soul is going to heal. So, uh, like I... Uh, 
I feel that they are, they are the main points of the of of presence, but staying in pre staying present with love. Can I ask another question? Sure, about sure, fire away. Um, so these are two extremes. Mm -hmm. Are there any places in the middle as you're of course progressing? You might be able to have compassion for someone, but not. And, and, and explain what's gone wrong, yep. but not be able to feel what happened in their childhood as exactly. to why it happened. Because that's going to be, depend very much on your development. As right, so you've it. only shifted a little bit, so you can see... You can like, see a little bit. You can see what's just changed in you that hasn't in changed them. in them yet. That's correct. But you haven't released all of it in you to be able to... Tell what's in them. Exactly. And to feel what's in them. Yeah. What, what childhood event occurred in, them, in their past... That would that would allow you to feel their childhood event. You see, if you can't, ha if you haven't released it yourself, then you're not going to be able to feel their event and what occurred for them. The, the reality is, the soul is like an open book. You know, there's a, in the age circles, there's this concept of, you know, the soul records, if you like, the akashic records they call them. Well, that's just your soul, an open book to anybody who has the development to feel it, and. And the reality is the more development we get in love, the more we can feel the soul of others. The more we can feel their true nature and condition, the more we can feel their errors, the more we have compassion for them, the more we understand where they're coming from, the more we see why they have that error based on what happened during their childhood. And we actually can recall to them their childhood events that they can't even recall themselves because that record is available to us. That's what happens once we have development in love. Now, obviously, that's fully developed in love, let's call that, although there's no such thing because it's an infinite in progression in love. But for most of us, we're here. We're not fully developed in love. So there's some parts of that that we can do, but other parts we cannot. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so what we need to come to terms with is the fact that while we're developing, we're not going to be able to see everything in everyone else. We're not going to be able to see everything. We're not going to be able to be present all the time. None of these things that we've described will be, we'll be able to do all the time. However, we'll be able to at least aim for them if we are focused on the progression of our soul. Yeah. But you're right. Um, it is a gradual process of becoming present. Um, but as we notice more and more, we'll become more and more fixed on becoming present, you know, with love, being love when discussing truth. And we will avoid more and more the discussions where, and when I say avoid, we won't avoid the actual discussion. We'll confront the reasons for the unlovingness in the discussion before we answer any questions, if we notice that love is not present. So you can see myself doing that more and more in my discussions with people and also more and more in my presentations where more and more I am becoming more certain and more direct with people about the lack of love. You know, we're, after all, we're, they're coming along to hear about love, to, to grow in love, and yet they're being unloving right in that moment. And so more and more we're trying to address those particular issues yeah, and therefore allow love to be present in the room. If love's present in the room of 200 people, speaking the truth has a powerful effect on 200 people. If love is not present in the room with 200 people, speaking the truth has zero effect almost on, on the people generally in the room. And that's something we need to understand about this issue of presence, the power of love to open the soul to experiencing itself and experiencing emotion and eventually absorbing truth. So that uh, brings us to the conclusion of the six points that we wanted to discuss today. So I'd like to thank you for your time, Lily, in doing thank that. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, that was a pleasure. And uh, hopefully uh, anybody who's listening to this particular discussion, my suggestion if you're on the FAQ channel, that the future FAQ questions that we are going to be asked about the soul, many of them will refer to these particular points in those discussions. And so... So it's great if you can go through these things, these particular things myself and Lily have discussed in understanding the particular aspects of how the soul operates because it will help greatly in understanding the, my answers to the different questions that people ask about how the soul operates during the, on the FAQ channel. But we'd like to thank you for our time today. This will be an interview as well as a series of questions um, or statements on the FAQ channel. So we look forward to seeing you on both of those channels 
at, at some point when you listen to this, 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 this discussion. Thanks for your time and thanks for Lena and Igor for doing our recording, our long recording for us today. Thanks, guys.